Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Ricky Cassidy, and I've been hosting this show for about six segments now. Thanks to a great friend of mine, Dennis Izaki. I have sad news about Dennis. Um, when he invited me to come on this, he was alluding to his not well. Uh, he understated it. He passed away this week. Uh, he is sorely missed. Um, he got me into this as a friend, and uh, he had named the show. Uh, after his particular interests, which were his land and politics. Dennis, uh, for those of you that didn't know him, uh, was one of the few Japanese people living or growing up in Anahola, Kauai, which is on the east side, very rural and very Hawaiian. Um, had three or four brothers, uh, all of which were accomplished. He himself specialized in surveying. Guy was tough as nails, went all over the Pacific as a surveyor with some really great companies, came home and started arguably the best surveying and, and engineering company on, on the island uh, with a close friend of his, Wayne Wada. They grew up together in Anahola. Um, I segue this uh, in part because I want to jump over to my guest today uh, and give him a little context and you, the audience. Uh, of what I'm doing here. Uh, Dennis's proclivity for land came because um, he believed in surveying. Uh, he extended that into a shrewd appreciation of land policy and how it's changed over time. And he would argue what was best for local people in terms of uh, the trend in adding regulations to development. Uh, or li liberalize them. He's a bear on tax policy, did not want property taxes going up for us. Um, and of course, then he segued that into politics because that would be the regulating force behind it. Where Dennis and I kind of intersect was an appreciation of land, my particular appreciation uh, for land, slightly different. Uh, I do market research and I see lots of people outside of Hawaii coming here uh, to buy land and to live here, high quality of living. Um, and uh, that gets me over to the, uh, the, my guest today, whose expertise is Aloha shirts. Uh, and where we intersect on that is that Aloha shirts have been wildly successful perhaps even a surrogate for uh, buying Hawaiian land. You get to buy uh, a Hawaiian Aloha shirt and live that quality of life without being in Hawaii. Um, and he and I, old friends, talk long about things. Um, his father and I, my father did, uh, we're both businessmen and we grew up in that context. And um, I'm going to let him uh, kind of talk a little bit about how he got into the business uh, and uh, the kinds of things that resonate with him and then resonate with the locals and then resonate with the rest of the world. So, Dale, take it over. Oh, thank you, Ricky. Um, I've just had a passion for Aloha shirts ever since I was, I can think, all the way back to third grade. My dad was a shirt maker uh, when I was growing up. And about the third grade, my father came home with a whole bunch of Aloha shirts for me that I could wear to school. And they were very unique. And one of the patterns had beach boys wearing blue makahas. Those were long shorts with stripes on the sides, playing the ukulele, wearing the coconut hats, having the aunties in the background doing the hula. And I wore that shirt, I think, um, until it was threadbare. And, you know, it's just... It was just my favorite shirt. It echoed the spirit of the beach at Waikiki down when there were more koa canoes on the beach in Waikiki than there were hotels. You know, there was the Royal and the Moana, and there was all these great bronze beach boys. And, you know, at the end of the day, they would always wear these really neat shirts that were Hawaiian shirts, Aloha shirts, if you would. And they kind of set the hook on me early on, one that they were these ocean going guys. They, you know, almost had gills on their sides. They were always in the water doing something really exciting. And then they wore these great gorgeous shirts that kind of connected them to a place, which was that beach in Honolulu and Waikiki. 
So it's, it's just been something that um, kind of grew with me early on. And then I started working with my dad in the 70s. And you know, many years, I was able to get the name Kahala, which was an early garment manufacturer, started in 1936. And it had been a dormant name for a long time. And so I was able to change our company to Kahala by HRH, which was the other label we were using. And we went out and sold a lot of shirts and started developing our prints with artists or textile artists or fine artists. And we started really having fun with it and doing prints that we thought would identify with our customers. And, you know, we, we got to work with people like Avi Curiati, a really great block print and oil painting artist that was originally on the Big Island. And then from RV, we went with John Severson, and then we got to work with, you know, John started Surfer Magazine. He was a fabulous artist uh, living in Maui, and I used to go over there and work with him. We'd work together. And then we started working with Yvonne Chang, a notable artist on the island of Oahu. Uh, her art hangs in many of the banks and finer homes throughout the islands. And I was able to conjole her into thinking about doing textile designs and it, it took a long time, but we ended up working with Yvonne and had a great relationship. And I've worked with many other fine artists, textile artists, and many people all around the world to create all the designs we've done. We've done well over thousands of designs um, over the years. So it's just, it's, it's really trying to, I think, capture that spirit of Hawaii that you and I appreciate that we grew up with and echo that on fabric and shirts. So we kind of communicate to people that we respect this place, we appreciate this place, and we admire all of the attributes of the Hawaiian Islands that we can put into a shirt and, and make them and wear them and, and smile and be happy that we're replicating something that he speaks of a wonderful spot. One of the things I thought was so cool when I came home from Hawaii, uh, and I'd been gone, say, from 76 to 90, 90, something like that. You started Kahala with Avi, who was a uh, very strong and powerful um, artist in the sense that his, that was the effect of his clothes. Uh, and what struck me was your palette. Uh, of being bright and colorful and cheerful and powerful. And uh, I don't mind if I'm wrong, but I'd come from, in part, living in England, uh, where the palette of that fashion uh, was taken off of the moors, meaning mustards and light and dark browns and gray skies and the whole thing. They did it very well. Burberry uh, is a world fashion, uh, world-renowned um, TM pattern. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not a bright color. Uh, what I liked about that bright color is it resonated. Uh, I moved back to Hawaii from Silicon Valley, and there's a whole bunch of guys over there that just started buying that stuff and showing up at the office. And so you want to speak about, you know, what... What happened there? I mean, you did do colors probably stronger than a lot of other people in a different way than, say, Jams did, which is pretty bright, but not very de detailed. Uh, and then the success you had in California and other places. Yeah, thanks, Ricky. Um, you know, I think Jams, Dave Rockland was, you know, he was a genius and he was our hero and he's in large part why I even thought about going into the garment industry. And he had the freedom to fail and he would do things that were brighter, say, than most other companies. But, you know, he, he kind of had something for a little bit younger generation that was speaking out and getting more attention where our shirts were a little bit calmer. But we also wanted to have really nice color combinations in our shirts. And uh, our shirts were geared for the downtown Kamaaina businessman. We had button down collars and half placket shirts, much like what Ren Spooner had done. 
Um, so we were we were selling to the businessman, so and the banker and the the guys trying to conduct business. So you can't make them too bright, but you don't want to put anybody to sleep either. So you wanna you wanna have some vitality in your print, but it can't be too crazy. And you know, oftentimes back in those days, we did a lot of reverse print. So you take the fabric instead of making it the shirt on the right side, which we did for the tourists because they liked it brighter. We made it reverse for the, the downtown combine a businessman. And that made it a lot more subtle. And, um, you know, our designs were fun. John Severson did uh, great art that was a lot more colorful. He pushed the envelope quite a bit with what he was doing for us. And we had some other guys like California artist surfer uh, Ron Anderson. His were really colorful and probably some of our best sellers too. So we had a variety of artists and we were doing 150 designs a year. So we had, we had all spectrums, you know, super bright and in the middle and, and softer. One of the things that you and I had as an experience was going to the Philippines and we walked into their major shopping, um, I think call it Magnum or, or whoever, uh, it was just, we walked into the store, started looking at shirts and lo and behold, we're a bunch of Hawaiian shirts. And the irony was, and you pointed it out, was that uh, they had reversed the reverse. So they seriously had copied this and, and then instead of the words being backwards, they were now forwards and it was a crack up. But uh, the fact that we could, that this was going on in the Philippines when we went there maybe 20 years ago also kind of reflects back to how it spread. My guess is principally on, on the West Coast and then it went to the East Coast. And if you did, you know, that many designs a year, uh, what, if anything, can you say, um, was there any segmentation in the market? In, in other words, was there a West Coast popular um, look as opposed to a Hawaiian, as opposed to East Coast? Or did it trend and blend? Um, a little bit of all. You know, in Hawaii, we sold just about everything because you have the Kamaina a business guy you're selling to. You also have the resort visitor. And the resort visitor likes things brighter. And Kamaina likes them a little bit more refined, a little bit more dressed up, button down collar. California liked it fun. And we really weren't selling the resort world in California. We were selling the Newport Beach guy, the San Diego guy. Um, beach community uh, stores is really who we sold to. So they're wearing the reverse print Ivy League shirts, half blacket with shorts. And real happy in Balboa, Newport, San Diego, and areas like that. And, um, Florida, we sold a lot of fish shirts. Fish were king in Florida. Everybody fishes in Florida. So not they didn't really understand the reverse so as much, but they do understand all their favorite fish. So after going there, fishing with other, the Florid, Floridians, and uh, spending time there, we really started doing a lot of fish designs, which they really accepted and appreciated. So with that experience, you also went through the Japanese bubble. You ended up um, selling Kahala and moving over to Patagonia uh, in the middle of that. Um, for some reason, you decided to write a book. You're the last person on earth that, that I would have expected. I tried to convince and you wouldn't listen to any of my bad advice. Uh, but in so doing that, um, you then, you got a chance to see the Japanese market and their taste. You got to see Patagonia, which basically is a, a cold weather, cold water company. Uh, how they dealt with Aloha shirts or just fabrics and designs. Any, any thought about that? Well, that's kind of two questions in one. So first. Um, you know, I worked on the book and that was something that was really intriguing to me because I'd been in the industry and I knew a little bit about the history. And um, if you remember, you were helpful in introducing me to the Chun family. Ellery Chun was noted as the first 
person to ever create yellow shirt because he registered the name. Um, and I met somebody in the Musashia family, Mrs. Musashia. Um, and she said, you know, I wouldn't make the first Aloha shirt, but you know, the Paki down the street, he got all the credit, but no big deal, but I wouldn't make them. So you have this interest of, of these Asian diversity in downtown Honolulu, a block away from each other. And they were using Japanese kabi crepe fabric for women's robes and women's gowns and women's clothing. And they were, they were making those into shirts. And that's really how the whole thing started between uh, Ellery Chun and then uh, the Musashia uh, small you know, specialty stores. Um, that, you know, that, that has grown a, an enormous business. I mean, you want to think of how many millions of Aloha shirts have been made since 1935 pretty amazing. And, and in 1935, in August, like a week after John Barrymore goes into the store to the Musashias and says he wants a shirt, there's the picture of Shirley Temple at age five down at the harbor where 10,000 people came out to meet this childhood rock star. And she's wearing a Musashia shirt, Sailor Moku's charm bracelet, and from there, it really starts with the movie stars. And then we've got Duke Onomoko, and he starts wearing them. And then you've got all the Hollywood stars that wear them in movies. And it really starts to go nationwide in America, from Hawaii to California, New York. And then we've got our best ambassador, Duke Onomoko. And he's uh, an Olympic champion. He's a sheriff. And he... Uh, gets hooked up with Kahala in the late 30s. He's an ambassador with them. He goes with a company in New York called Cisco, and they have national distribution for all the finer, better men's stores throughout America. And they're making beautiful rayon short sleeve, long sleeve shirts. All the all the guys um, in the movie Here to Eternity, Bing Crosby and, and Burt Lancaster, all those guys are all wearing Here to Eternity shirts. So that helps get spread them out internationally, you know, beyond the shores of Hawaii. So it's it's been an interesting, um, you know, ride for the Aloha shirt. Elvis wore them, Tom Selleck wore them. Um, we've got, you know, George Clooney wore them in the movie Descendants. He wore a shirt that we made. So, you know, the the Obama wasn't so big on him. He 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 um, censored Aloha shirts. For the Apex Summit, um, I think back in 2011. Um, but you know that they've had a lot of endearment from a lot of international people. Uh, yeah, they have. They they do have legs in the sense that they've traveled. And uh, um, what I was then going to say was um, Patagonia picked them up, uh, but also the high end um, retail stores. You. Uh, we're describing going back uh, just recently to the East Coast and doing a book signing at a very high-end retail store that was um, the brainchild of Ralph Lauren, who himself um, was very successful taking a basic um, look and just expanding on it wildly. So I was in England um, when he started. Uh, Sidebar is that uh, I came back home to Hawaii got one of your shirts that said HRH on it, took it back to England. The customs guy looked at the shirt, saw HRH, and he wondered aloud, and he actually took the shirt. He said, "Is has this been sanctioned by the royal family? <laughs> it's royal highness. So um, you want to comment about Ralph Lauren and, and that experience? That would be sure. great. I'd love to. It's funny because HRH, my dad was Howard Robert Hope, and <laughs> he had those labels made because he used to gamble on, on Wednesday nights with all the the buyers for all the better, bigger stores and all the other manufacturers on, all together. And they those guys all called my dad HRH. And so he had those labels laying around as a joke. And when I started working with him, I needed a label. And he said, use this. I, I don't want to use that. He said, you don't have a choice. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and, and just for a second with um, Patagonia and Pataloha, 
you know, Patagonia was a company that made clothes that was going to save your life. Pataloha was something that you could wear to be more relaxed and have fun. And Pataloha really came from Rel Sun, you know, our, our great ambassador of Aloha and women's surfing champion from the west side, Makaha. Rel Sun, yeah. And she befriended the Chenards um, when they came out to Makaha to a surfing contest. And she ended up going there to work for them. And she designed prints for Pataloha. And then she also wrote a note to Melinda, Yvonne's wife, their co-owners of Patagonia, and really said that there was time for them to consider a book on Aloha shirts. So in, you know, 10 years ago, we published a book with Patagonia on the Aloha shirt, the 384-page book. And it's really great because it honors Rel's wishes. Yeah, pretty special. That I did not know. Yes, she was a great surfer. Oh, and a great woman. Unfortunately, she never got mad at me for giving her a low score when I judged the surfing heat, unlike some of the, the bigger male surfers who really could do me some harm. Um, but uh, um, I would have given her a 10 for just paddling out. Yeah, no, she, was an ex she had an extraordinary grace. You and I loved the water. We loved surfers. We loved... In the water, you get authenticity. It's kind of hard to uh, to hide. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the great things in my life, although uh, my dad at the start was somewhat skeptical whether surfing was good for me or not, did kind of truncate my business career by five or six years, was, you know, following something that you loved uh, because it was that really powerful, awesome, cool, uh, it, it was life giving, and um, uh, it, we have seen the, the, many more people jump into it. But that the, the same standard of um, you know be, fun in the ocean as well as competency in in dealing with it, and then uh, kind of like Aloha shirts, the, the the number of design modifications, improvements on, for want of a better word, aquatic toys and how big that aquatic toy industry has become. Um, there must have been, uh, not just in your life, the, the, the crossover between the Aloha shirt in Waikiki and, and, and the surfing. Um, one of your better prints was a surfboard um, design in which you incorporated arguably the best surfboard designer I've ever seen, um, Dick Brewer. Uh, hopefully, uh, nobody that's still alive will call up and say I was better than Dick. But um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about working on, uh, on I mean, on surfboard templates. It's not easy. You know, you know Ricky, uh, back in the days when we would go down to Tom's, I was at Bessie Winkler's house one day, and, and uh, Joey Cabell came in, and he told me that he was meeting Dick Brewer, mm -hmm to design a board. And I looked at him and he had it all uh, drawn out on graph paper. And I went, wow, you're, 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 you're really, um, you know, pretty deliberate about what you want. He goes, well, the surfboard shaper is only as good as the information he gets from the surfer. And I was like, wow, you know, that was pretty amazing. So I always followed Dick Brewer. I was 16 in those days, you know, all my life. And I knew that he was the quintessential shaper for the surfing stars, if you would, uh, in our lifetime. And so we asked Dick if he would draw out all the meaningful boards that he did in his career. And we got these kind of just scratched out line drawings of boards that really you could tell the shapes and what was going on in the skeg shape and all that. But, you know, I had to justify this a build that, you know, we were going to, pay Dick for these drawings, and it was really just chicken scratch on a bunch of sheets of paper. But we added some sort of mid-century modern blocks of color, blotches of color in with these boards. And we, we created that print about 20 years ago. It's still, I think, Kahala's number one print today. They, they're doing it really, really well. And they've also... Uh, 
use it as the salt and pepper shaker print now in first class in Hawaiian Airlines. They, they have a little origami shirt and then they, they do it as a little, little salt and pepper holder. And it's the Dick Brewer shirt. So it has, it has life way beyond just being a shirt, but that's everybody's favorite shirt, for sure. So let me get into an argument uh, I lost with you, uh, wrongfully so. Um, when you started the Aloha Shirt book, uh, captivated me, I said, okay, great. This is a product where you can go to Omaha uh, and, and people will go, oh, uh, reminiscent of when Bruce Brown did Endless Summer, um, and he showed it in the Midwest, and crowds came and went, wow. So from that epiphany of sorts, uh, I started saying, okay, what else? What are the other products that you can do a book on and take, uh, do a book on? What are the other Hawaiian products that you can do a book on? Go to Omaha, and they go, aha. And um, there wasn't many. Um, you let me struggle a little bit on, on, on identifying it. So uh, I did do the Hawaiian surfboard. I said, okay, not that they'll recognize it, but it's unique to Hawaii. Uh, I branched out a little and I said, the Hawaiian detective movie with Charlie Chan to Tom Selleck. I kind of like that one. Uh, that probably would have made money. And then the other was the Hawaiian hotel room. Uh, and in recognition of the name of this um, segment, also Dennis Sasaki, it was that kind of thinking uh, that um, attached somewhat to, to, to the reality that over our lifetime, we've seen more and more people move here and real estate prices go up and up and more and more resorts uh, being built. Now. Here's the money question, um, leaving everything else I set behind. Um, are we at, a, I mean, when we grew up, there's hardly any tourists. Now, uh, I think I can say there's too many. It, do you have any thought about, you know, uh, that and, and, um, and what it means uh, for the future? Both you and I uh, would have to agree that, that our business relies on repeat um, buyers. Uh, but I mean, as a Keiki Hokaina, um, child of Hawaii, what do you think? Well, you're kind of uh, taking us away from the Aloha shirt subject here, but you know, obviously if they all come and they all want to buy Aloha shirts, then we think it's a good thing, right? Right. That's, what, that's what my father did when he started his business. He was making shirts for the visitors. In those days, there weren't that many hotels or stores. And as we grew up, there were more stores, more hotels, more people, jets. You know, people weren't coming on boats anymore. They went from prop planes to jets and more jets and more airlines. And, you know, today we've got kind of a saturation point, I believe, where everything is pretty, pretty stressed out. You know, our oceans are very, very full and we don't have enough bathrooms for them. We don't have enough facilities for them. We're really lucky sometimes here on this island if the number one beach in Hawaii, Hapuna, has running water. So I think we've stressed out our natural spots and our, our places where everybody wants to go. We've advertised them to the extent where they're they're being overcrowded. I mean, look what's happening. Everybody wants to go to your island, to go to Kauai, go to Honolulu, go to Hyena. And that's been stressed out. So, you know, sure, it's all great for business, good for hotels, car rentals, and everything else. But what's the cost to the, to the island, to the land, to the Aina? I think, you know, those are questions that we, we need to ask. The days when people came to visit in our parents' generation, they came on the Lurleen. There weren't too many of them. They were treated like royalty. They were treated by the kings on the beach, all the beach boys. And they had an experience that was incredible. 
And they left being touched in their hearts that these wonderful people, men, women, you know, gals at the end of the day would they play ukulele and sing songs and the gals would do the hula right there on the beach wearing their mumus. And they'd wear a lay and share flowers with the guests. And that was pretty incredible. Today, everything's plastic lays and, and too many people. So, um, you know, I think you, you asked a question about a little bit earlier about going back to the mainland, going back to the Hamptons and, and doing a little book talk in that uh, double RL Ralph Lauren store. And uh, I will say that the Aloha spirit back there was really alive and well. People want to know about Hawaii. They want to, in their minds, be able to put a little space in there for a future trip to go to Hawaii because they all came out to probably one of Ralph Lauren's best stores. Double RL is the pinnacle of what he really wants to do. They're curated beyond belief. They're the they're most elegant stores I've ever been in. And that store was packed. I mean, there was no standing room. But people came to learn about the shirts. They came to learn about Hawaii and to get a little taste of something that they know they want to have a part of. And they want to come here. They want to see what we have. They want the warm water, the sunshine, the beautiful flowers, lays. You know, they, they brought lay to the Hamptons and people had them and they had gorgeous Hawaii flowers everywhere. It was, it was an insane, incredible event. They made cookies all out of the images of the Aloha shirts that were in my book. The, the baker who did them gets five stars. He replicated Jerry Lopez's board that's in the book with the Pario print that Michael Cassidy did on the board. And they were, they were no bigger than, than that big. And they were in, incredible along with all these other images. So, you know, we, we, I think have, some homework to do to, to manage our, our visitor count and to keep it elegant in Hawaii and not let it go to, you know, such a, like a Vegas experience, which I fear it's heading more in that direction than maintaining the elegance that we once had. The reason why I had you here was to talk about the spirit. The spirit does infuse the land, but the spirit goes beyond the land across the ocean everywhere. Um, we're way past our time, um, figuratively and, <laughs> and realistically, but uh, this is a nice moment. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet, Rick. Thanks for having me with you today. Appreciate yes. it. Good fun. Aloha. All right. Take care. Aloha. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.